Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker and you're watching Weekly Wipe, a programme all about things that are happening. Things like this. Straw suspended, Rifkind resigns following undercover sting operation. It's ignited a row about MPs with second jobs. Must be worrying for David Cameron, who, in addition to his role as Prime Minister, has been caught on video working as a builder, a train driver, an IT engineer, a mechanic, a factory worker, an evangelical preacher and a shiny-chinned succubus of the damned. Green Party leader Natalie Bennett's reduced emissions cause undeniable man-made catastrophe during interview. But what is the total cost of 500,000 homes? Um... Billions were entertained by glamorous coverage of the Oscars. In triumphant scenes, Eddie Redmayne picked up the Best Actor Oscar, which then surprised him by unexpectedly going hot in his hand. This... this Oscar... <laughs> More of that sort of thing later, but let's start here. Wrong bit, there. Can you believe we've had 30 years of EastEnders? 30 years! For 30 years we've laughed, we've cried, not at EastEnders, obviously, no. We've just stared at that dispassionately like a dog glancing at a skirting board. Oh, it stinks in here, doesn't it? A lot's changed since the first episode was broadcast in scintillating shit vision back in 1985. Oh, come on, Mum. It wasn't Arthur's fault they closed the factory down and no-one wanted his dinky. In 1985, we were stuck in a Cold War with Russia. We worried about terrorists. We fretted about the divide between rich and poor. And there was an increasingly unpopular Tory in Downing Street. Whereas these days, we've got all of those things, plus Nando's and Wi-Fi. Anyway, to doof doof up some interest, contemporary EastEnders held a special novelty Death of a Teenage Girl Week in which it unveiled the killer of Lucy Beale, daughter of fish and chip mogul Ian Beale, a man so luckless and downtrodden he stands out as a shit magnet even on Albert Square. Poor old Beely boy's been shot, cook-holded, beaten up, widowed, bullied, blackmailed, turned into a tramp, and now his daughter's been murdered. No wonder he's had a complete mental breakdown. What is that? This is your Auntie Pauline. Anyway, who killed Lucy is just the latest in a string of nail-biting questions posed on EastEnders. We've all got our favourites. Who could forget Alfie, what's the time? Alfie, what's the time? How do I get it so that I'm a rally driver? How do I get it so that I'm a rally driver? And the spine-tingling, you're going to go full-time at the chicken shop. You're going to go full-time at the chicken shop? I don't know about you, but I was up all night worrying about that one. Anyway, this being a sprawling whodunit, there was a square full of suspects. Was it Drew Barrymore, Alan Shearer, Tintin, Zoella, Sean Locke, Clara Oswald, Lord Sugar, Nick Grimshaw, Alex Jones, Boris Johnson, Vladimir Putin or HSBC? They all had a motive, probably. Having spent the best part of a year building up to the big reveal, the tension was kept at a peak with an insane number of scenes in which someone was about to utter something important. I found something out. What? Only to have to suddenly clam up when another character came in. Dad? Oh, God, this is worse than working in an open-plan office trying to slag someone off by the photocopier. You just can't get it done. There's no privacy. Look! No matter what I do, I can't get it out of my head. Get what out of your head? Yeah, get what out of your head? Hey, you are. Oh. oh, God, not Ben Mitchell again. What is this? Interruption Street? Do you still think that I killed her? If that's Ben Mitchell, tell him to f off. As the climax loomed closer, they stopped pussyfooting around and direct accusations and false confessions flew about the square like startled starlings. She knows. Who knows what? Well, you killed Lucy. You know who killed Lucy. Lucy was killed in this house. I don't know nothing about who killed Lucy. Dad thinks I murdered Lucy. She killed Lucy. He killed Lucy. I killed Lucy. God, I'm starting to think I killed Lucy. Hope I got away with that double bluff. No one suspects me. Hello? It's me. Oh, hi, Ian. What's up? I know. What do you know? You killed Lucy. Shit, uh, sorry. Sorry, Ian. I've got to go. Uh, ben Mitchell's here. <laughs> the other main gimmick was that the episodes contained special live elements indicated by a hashtag in the top right corner. The trouble with the live element was that while it was undeniably nail-biting, it just made you even more keenly aware that what you're watching is a work of fiction especially when the cast accidentally refer to other characters by the actor's name, as Tanya Branning did here. How's Adam? Yeah, how is Adam? 
Oh, not another interruption. There isn't even anyone there. The potential for mistakes like that to be broadcast live made the cast understandably anxious. In fact, several of them looked like they were going to be sick with nerves, and some of them actually were. <laughs> Hmm, better out than in. Luckily, Shane Rich is such a pro, he wasn't phased at all when Kat started vomiting. He just called in an understudy to finish off her lines. Stace, do you want to take over it, please? Anyway, the night of the big reveal, the show pulled out all the stops, unleashing the sort of crime wave London hasn't seen since the 2011 August riots. Mick Carter beat off Dean in the basement of the Vic until his horrified daughter pulled him off just to make it stop, while Dot shockingly confessed to killing her son, Nick, I've killed my son. Then turn the air blue, flinging four-letter insults at her fellow cast members. You can't! Oof, that's a bit strong. There were also some Easter eggs for fans. You hurt me. Get him up, pup. The anniversary special opened with an homage to the very first episode featuring identical sound effects and dialogue. Oh, stinks in here, doesn't it? Oh, it really stinks in here, doesn't it? Oh, you'd have thought they'd have fumigated the place in the intervening 30 years. And there was also a gasp-inducing scene in which legendary character Kath returned from the grave for a face-to-face -face conversation with Phil she could have held on the phone. Hello, Phil. Oh, at last, two people in the middle of nowhere. At least no-one's going to interrupt this scene. Please, Phil. I've got to go. Oh, God, if that's Ben Mitchell, tell him to f off. Topping it all was a sort of flashback Crime Watch reconstruction special, which spookily flashed all the way back to April 2014. Do you remember April 2014? Oh, it was like a different age, wasn't it? We hadn't heard of the iPhone 6 or the iPhone 6 Plus, and Lucy Beale was still alive for a bit. Turns out, on the night she died, Lucy Beale bumped into absolutely everyone in the world and had a shit time with all of them. The shock twist came when the whole thing turned into an episode of Kids Do the Bloodiest Things, as teeny Bobby Beale was revealed to be the killer. Whatever she says, she started it. She made everyone unhappy. Yes, Bobby had whacked Lucy round the head with a flimsy-looking music box and inadvertently killed her. He must have a heck of a swing on him. He's the next Tiger Woods. In fact, he's just like Tiger Woods. He's a lady killer with blondes falling at his feet. Poor Ian was stunned. Oh, cheer up, mate. Don't think of it as losing a daughter. Think of it more as gaining a murderer. I love you. I love you too. Oh, he's the sweetest killer since refined sugar. All things considered, EastEnders' anniversary week was something of a triumph. The cast pulled it off, the integration of live elements was seamless, the reveal was genuinely electrifying, and the majority of viewers seemed satisfied. Right. We will be. Apart from a few oddballs who complained to Ofcom. Not because the killer was a boy, but because unlike every other plot point, which is spoiled in advance on the covers of gaudy soap mags, Bobby Beale's guilt hadn't been signposted enough for their liking, which is the whole point of a whodunit, otherwise it's a no-dunit. Still, let's not get carried away. I mean, it was good, but anyone can do live television. In fact, all my studio links this week are going to be performed live, starting now. Q live link. <laughs>Oh, uh, um, yes. Fuck. It's, sorry. Um, yes, next is... Um, next is... Bobby Beale. Yeah, OK, yes, yeah, thanks, I knew that. Uh, Bobby Beale. Bobby Beale, we just saw there, is a, a kid, a mere child. But what drove him to kill? Could it be the... Um, could it be the influence of television itself? Well, someone else who's, who's worried about that is Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Adam, Mr. Mr. Russell Brand, uh, who joins us now for his True Evolution item. Uh, is, it, is it QVT or Run VT? Neither. Uh, it doesn't matter. We're out now. Hello, Krishna. I'm Russell Brand, and this is True Evolution, wafting away the systemic plutocratic miasma of modernity to reveal the authentic human reality that resides in a beneathment. This week, I'm looking at television. Like any man made device, television is a drug, a an HB opium of the masses, designed to keep them on their sofas instead of out in the streets refusing to comply with road signs. 
as you can see, literally everything on television is insidiously evil. They try to bamboozle you at an early age with children's televisions, like In the Night Garden, right? It's an insidious fable. Hello, Eagle Piggle. <laughs> Starring a cartoon abstraction of David Cameron roaming the verdant rolling hills of his personal idealised England, filled with ethnic minorities sleeping outdoors, the noble pensioner reduced to collecting stones like a man doing hard labour, and proletarian families sleeping ten to a room in their overcrowded slum dwellings. Peppa Pig's worse, right? On the face of it, she inhabits an idyll, a world in which all are equal, pig, elephant, rabbit, and whatever that one is, communing harmoniously in a functioning and attractive utopia. I'm not a flower, I'm Peppa Pig. <laughs> But there's one, right, where she meets the Queen, the actual one. And now, a special message from the Queen. The Queen! The Queen! <laughs> but she ain't played by a pig or a dog or even a swad, yeah? She's a human being. Hello to you all. Hello, Queen! They depict her image as a sole human being in a world of lowly creatures who instantly adopt the craven subservience of the indoctrinated in her presence. I am the Queen. All Pepper and her mates are good for is frolicking in dirt. Pepper and George love jumping up and down in muddy puddles. Everyone loves jumping up and down in muddy puddles. Anyway, till next time, I'm Russell Brand. Remain beautiful and quizzical. Ari Krishna, peace out. Oh, that's cold, mate. <laughs> nah. I have to get me a new one. <laughs>Tolerance and a former UKIP councillor causes a stir with controversial racially charged comments in a BBC documentary. The only people I do have problems with are Negroes. And I don't know why. Not a Chelsea fan by any chance, are you? I don't know whether there's something in my psyche or whether from a, it's karma from a previous life. Hmm, maybe you're a reincarnationalist. In other sad race relations news, this furtive phone footage showed a trainload of Chelsea fans shoving a man off the Paris metro, apparently because of the colour of his skin. Oh, if only he'd been born blue, then they'd like him. Having shoved him off the carriage, they then broke into some racist chanting. It's a bit like a musical, really, where the characters spontaneously burst into song to express their innermost feelings, but racist. A sort of far-right story. Anyway, both the councillor and those Chelsea fans might enjoy visiting America at the moment, which, as the news channel skillfully depicted, has turned almost exclusively white. There's frozen waterfalls, icy pavements, and hang on, who the hell ordered a delivery of more snow? Jesus Christ! Thing is, what with the whole planet being f***ed through a bin bag thanks to climate change, extreme weather is just weather these days. We're already getting so bored of extreme weather stories, the news has to give them snappy names just so we'll pay attention. It is Snowmageddon. Snowmageddon. Weather bomb. Snow emergency. Snowpocalypse. On snow, snow, Snowpocalypse Monday. What next? Serial chiller? Catastrophe? Isis? But never mind exciting names, the public was soon providing exciting visuals. Yes, lunatics were soon posting stomach-churning videos of themselves leaping from balconies, roofs and windows into the snow in the frankly narcissistic belief that God doesn't hate them and want them to die. Quite a few of the leapers did it in their underwear, leaving them looking like adulterers hurriedly escaping through a bedroom window at Christmas. Eventually, so many people wound up posting their capers online, the mayor of Boston had to go on TV and tell them off like he was their flipping dad or something. Something going around on Twitter where people are jumping out windows into snowbanks. First of all, it's a foolish thing to do, um, and you could kill yourself. So I'm asking people to stop the nonsense. Yes, America has now officially devolved to the point where public officials actually have to go on live television to remind people not to jump out of the window. The news pretended to be fairly disapproving of the craze, labelling it stupid. Bad idea, terrible idea. Yeah. Worst idea I've ever seen in my yeah. life. <laughs> yeah, no especially way. when a backflip. But they weren't so disapproving they could resist showing the footage before pulling a face and directing viewers to find more of it on their website. And if you haven't seen quite enough of that, there is plenty more uh, of people taking part in the Blizzard Challenge. That's on our website, itv.com forward slash news. There's this Oscars thing Hollywood does to celebrate the best films ever made. 
as long as they were made recently. It's really exciting to watch. The coverage of it was amazing. I mean, it's got loads of famous people in it, so it's like a film, but better, because it doesn't have the boring story bit. It was exciting this year because two of our actors were up against each other, Eddie Redmayne and Benelin Thundercrack. They both played geniuses, but different flavoured geniuses in these incredible looking films. One of them played this sort of computer genius and looked a bit like Sherlock Holmes. You need me a lot more than I need you. I, I like solving problems, Commander. He was so good at computers, he did hacking before computers were real. He had to make a big computer out of bits of typewriter and spinny power station things, and it was so powerful it killed Hitler. He was called Alan Turing, and the authorities persecuted him because he was gay. Then they drew a veil over it, which is where the phrase Turing Shroud comes from. And the other one played this sort of Austin Powers man called Steve Hawking, who got cleverer and cleverer until he turned into a sort of robot. Anyway, anything won, which was just amazing to see. Thank you. Thank you. People said it was sort of annoying them two got nominated. It proves acting's just for posh people now. But you can still act without being posh. You just have to do different roles. Like, my mate Paul pretended to be in a neck brace for six months to get money from a car insurance company, and he won an award after he'd gone to court. What's clever about the Oscars is, it isn't just an actor's competition, it's also about films. Like, it had all these different films that wanted to be the best film, but only one of them could. The best films showed all the different things you can make films about. Because there's one about a man, and one about a man, and one about a man, and one about a boy turning into a man. And people said the films were all a bit manny, but there aren't any good films about women, except Mrs Doubtfire. And even then, they couldn't find a woman to play Mrs Doubtfire and had to get a man in. One of the favourites to win was this film called Boyhood, which was really clever. It was like 12 years a slave, but he was 12 years a boy. Being a boy didn't look as bad as being a slave, but he still had to do stuff when people told him to. Put that homework in your backpack. Go eat! The main actor was amazing because he played a boy and played a man, and he played all the bits in between. It was so interesting. It was like a slow motion Hulk, getting bigger, but really slowly. The special effects were amazing. You could almost believe it could actually happen in real life. There was one called Whiplash. It was like the Karate Kid done in drums. You're rushing. Here we go. Five, six, and... It's probably the best film there's been about drumming since that brilliant one where the little rabbit wins the battery competition. There was a sort of made-up documentary type thing called American Snipper about a hero who bravely hid miles away, peeping through a telescope and valiantly killing people who couldn't possibly hurt him from where they were standing. People said it glorified killing, but it didn't glorify all killing, only far away killing, which isn't as bad because you don't get any on your shoes. One of the films was called Big Bucharest Hotel. It's sort of like Hello, Hello, the movie. It was set in a sort of painting and looked like the sort of thing you'd have to physically hold me down and force me to watch. And even then, I'd be trying to forget it while it was happening. There was one called Birdman, which is about a superhero pretending to be an actor, or the other way around. Or both, I don't know, because I didn't see it because it wasn't showing at the cinema near me, because every screen at the cinema near me has just been showing Iron Man 3 on a loop for the past 400 years. And in the end, that one won. Birdman. <laughs> Anyway, I hope they make more films so they can do another Oscars next year, but maybe less of them so it doesn't last so fucking long. The economy is one of the key issues in the forthcoming election, which means we've all seen a lot of button-eyed Chancellor Adam Osborne waddling around desperately boosting employment statistics by pretending to be a workman. And when he's not playing the odd job man, he's all over our screens, incessantly barking the phrase long-term economic plan like a hard-to-love novelty keyring. And that is what our long-term economic plan for the Midlands... Long-term economic plan. Working through an economic plan. Long-term economic plan. Long-term economic plan. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you ever get sick and tired of saying long-term economic plan? 
but in the immediate aftermath of the HSBC revelations, Osborne seemed to be lying low, keen to avoid discussing avoidance, unlike he was back in 2003, when he gleefully appeared on the Daily Politics in a sort of money-saving expert penny lickers slot, mouth-shitting some tax advice. There are some pretty clever financial products which enable you to, in effect, pass on your home or the value of your home to your uh, son or daughter. And uh, well, and then get personal care paid for by the state. I probably shouldn't be advocating this on. Right, well, it was 2003. He probably thought he was safe discussing economic plans back then. Should have been thinking long term. But after a bit of good economic news, Osborne popped back up again, highly visible in high vis, and he delivered a polished soundbite. These figures are really strong figures. They come on top of the very low rate of inflation, the high rate of employment. A lot of got a lot of got a lot, got lots of good news in our economy at the moment. I'm sorry, what did you say? A lot of got a lot of got lots of good news in our economy at the moment. All oh, right, we lot of got a lot of got a lot of lots of good news in our economy at the moment. That's a pretty good campaign slogan as these things go. Still not a patch on Ed Miliband's truly inspirational ah oh from last week. Ah. Uh. Ah. Oh. Says it all. Gets better every time I hear it. While the politicians trade sound bites, the HSBC scandal continues to unfold, but it's attracting little popular anger. Probably because money stories are just so impossibly dull. I mean, it's no fun hating HSBC. Everything about it is boring. Its name is boring. Its function is boring. Switzerland's boring. There's no palpable visual villain for you to get a mental foothold on. Just that building, which is boring. At least when it turned up in the background of EastEnders this week, I got excited for a moment because I thought, maybe it turned out to have killed Lucy, but no, that'd be interesting. And that building isn't interesting, it's boring. Boo! Television, and following its eye-opening item on bondage a few weeks ago, brunch time horror show this morning descends further into extreme kink with an item on dogging. Not the grubby car park variety, this is more romantic. He's about to go on dates with three single dog owners, but has to choose them only using photos and descriptions of their dogs. Yes, this single, iron-pumping, dog-loving Ross Kemper-like chooses a date based on nothing but photographs of her dog. We've given him seven dogs to choose from. Like he's swiping through dog Tinder looking for casual walkies. Dog three is Bubbles, the Yorkshire Terrier Cross. Yeah, this is just ridiculous. As if you could fall in love simply by looking at a picture of a dog. Go. Five is Daisy Duke, the Labradoodle. Dog six is Frank. Uh, uh, sorry, where was I? OK, on with the item. Having whittled the pooches down to a short list of three, Ross then goes on dates with the hounds in question. But annoyingly, their owners show up too, the Gooseberries. His first encounter with the lovely Emma and her dog goes quite well. Hello. How are you? How are you doing? You're right. Yeah, good. Nice to meet you. I can see why it would be romantic taking a pair of dogs on a date. The fresh country air, the companionship, the bit where you put a carrier bag on your hand and scoop up a fistful of warm shit. But as the format wears on, he starts to seem more interested in the canines than the humans. My first reaction to Daisy Duke and Nicole was a stunning dog. I really loved her dog. Beautiful dog. Sadly, the show chickens out of encouraging him to have full sexual intercourse with a dog, like I'm implying, and instead Ross chooses the human called Emma. And judging by the smiles in the studio later, the pair of them are pretty happy. Do we think we're going to see each other again? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If they end up sleeping together, I suppose the whole thing's been a shaggy dog story. This was only the latest this morning bid to inject a bit of needless dog into proceedings. A few weeks ago, they ran an item on dog yoga, which was full of dubious science. We are connected to our dogs. It's so simple. Our nervous system is completely connected to our dog's nervous system. Really? What? Down the lead? It also contained the revelation that rhythmically stroking a furry thing between your legs can provide a relaxing release of energy before degenerating into the sort of extreme imagery you'd expect to find on the dark web rather than an item on daytime TV. Right up to the ceiling. I Extend your tail, your human tail, forward. Anyway, not content with shoving dog in one end, they soon concentrated on oral canine relations, conducting an interview with a man who tests dog food for a living by eating it. I taste pet food. Wonder if he wags his tail if he likes it. This culminated in a culinary high point as Schofield tucked into a bowl full of brown dog you gulp. Oh, you get well, now that's, there's no need. See? That's not bad. Hmm. Wonder if that's the first time he's found himself swallowing a mouthful of pal at this time of day. Still, gross though this was, it wasn't quite as extreme as the scatological looking two hosts, one cup style item they'd hosted in a previous episode. Uh. 
Lots still to come this morning, including Warwick Davis. Back in a minute. Mm. <laughs> Well, if that made you feel sick, maybe you need some medicine. But what exactly is medicine? Here to find out is our very own Philomena Kunk with one of her moments of wonder. For thousands of years, man has been getting better, thanks to one single thing, medicines. Medicines means we can treat everything from made-up diseases like the plague to modern epidemics like allergicness to bread. The ancient Egyptians thought that onions were medicine, but they're not. They literally didn't know they are onions, and that's where we get the phrase from. Of course, today, we now know that onions are not a medicine. Onions are disgusting. Despite all the advances in medicine, there are still some things we can't cure. The common cold, the squints, dicky tummies. Doctors are working on this as we speak, and even when we're not speaking, because some of them work nights. To understand medicine, the best way is to try them all, but apparently that's dangerous, so I'm talking to a medicine man. Hello, um, who are you? My name is John Martin, and I'm a doctor. And uh, what do you do? I'm Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at University College London, which means that I see patients, I do research and I teach. So what's medicines? Medicines, if we're talking about tablets... Well, I was thinking more the liquid ones. Well, uh, the liquid ones are the same as the, tab as the tablets, only they're normally given to children who can't take tablets. Ah, right. That's a big difference. Why can't we get um, medicine crisps? You know, cos no-one likes needles and everyone likes crisps. Well, there's a thing called the risk-benefit ratio. So whenever we do anything to a patient, we have to weigh up the harm we're doing uh, as opposed to the good we're doing, and there's always a downside. And if we had medicine crisps, I think the amount of carbohydrate and fats and salt we'd be taking in with the crisps would outweigh the good that's done by the medicine. So I think that's a very good idea, actually. Right. And, and like, if you had, like, Monster Munch, that wouldn't work as well as medicines. Sorry, Monster Munch. Could you explain that to me? It's like a puffy crisp. They're lovely. You can get, like, pickled onion and beef. Right. Again, I'd have to weigh up the risk-benefit ratio of... What did you call the Monster...? Monster Munch. Monster Munch, uh, mixed with the medicine, uh, the, the bad it would do versus the good. Right. Um, bon Jovi sung about bad medicine. Um, I think we're going to look at a clip of that now. Right. Don't worry. If you can just nod your head as if you've seen the clip. So, was that medically accurate? Uh, no, it wasn't. They say that laughter's the best medicine. But if that were true, why do so many comedians die of cancer? Perhaps they weren't funny enough. It's a sobering thought. And that's useful because many comedians are also alcoholics. Next time on Moments of Wonder, I'll be asking, where did these robots come from? Well, that's all we've got time for this week. Until next time, go away.